Hey everybody, welcome back to the Revelation Bible Study. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor of Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas. And we are going through the entire book of Revelation as a church. Last year, uh, I said that we would go through the entire book of Revelation in 2020, and then uh, COVID hit, and our sermon series changed, and you know the way we did church changed. But in my heart, I still felt like this is something that God wanted me to do wanted me to talk about, felt like this was a subject matter that was appropriate for the times that we're, we are living in. And even now, uh, when, I, when I go places and people hear that I'm a pastor, they'll ask. They'll say, do you believe we are living in the end times? I, I think there is definitely uh, a fear and uh, a search for knowledge. I think people want to know. You know, They want to know what's going on or at least what's going to happen. And so Revelation is a good look into that future. Of course, this is John's vision, right? This is his revelation. And so we are all the way at Revelation 14. And so if there's something you want to particularly look at, you can use the subject uh, headings in our YouTube videos to find the passage you're looking for, or you can go back and start from the beginning. You're more than welcome to pick up in verse 14 here with us today. So this is Revelation 14, verse 14. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with a golden crowd on his head and the sharp sickle in his hand. This, of course, is Jesus, right? And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Okay, so this is Judgment Day, right? And uh, it says that the earth is fully ripe. So a tree that is ready to be harvested, ready to have all its fruit removed. And certainly a sickle is a harvesting tool. We're now gonna reap the earth, remove people from the earth. Now, are they removing believers or unbelievers? I think there's a theological argument for both, but uh, I think the the passage here is directing us to keep reading and and to see what comes next. And I just warn you in advance, it's graphic, okay? Verse 17 says, Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire. And he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So again, there's this image, right? The earth is ready to be harvested. The the grapes are ready. Things are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city. That means compressed. And the blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. How how is wine made, right? It's made from grapes, and the grapes have to be crushed. And back in the day, there used to be this big stone wheel that would spin, and it would crush the, the grapes repeatedly. But here it says that it's not so much the grapes that are crushed, but the unbelievers. The unbelievers are crushed in a wine press, and it says their blood, right? It says their blood oozes out of the press, so much so that it travels all the way up the height of a horse and then out for 200 miles. That's graphic. And it's a lot of blood. And this is why we don't like reading Revelation. This is why we're afraid of reading Revelation because it's gross and it's scary and it makes us uncomfortable and we're we're afraid. But it's passages like this that serve as a reminder. And this is why we read Revelation. We read it to know, to have the knowledge. This is a reminder that God hates sin. God is perfect. He cannot be in the presence of sin. And it's not that he just doesn't like sin or he'd rather not be around sin. God hates sin. 
we don't like even preaching the story of Jesus going into the temple and flipping the tables, right? We have that scene of Jesus, that nice, loving Jesus who loves kids, right? And he, we always see him in pictures holding sheep. And here's this story of him going into the temple and flipping tables and driving out the money changers, and he even makes a whip. And some pastors might even leave out the part where it says Jesus made a whip. But it's holy anger, right? It's holy anger. And one day, that holy anger gets unleashed on the world. And in that moment, it won't be rated G. It won't be rated PG. But make no mistake, it's not like this judgment comes and we don't have a warning or we don't have a chance or a second chance or a third chance. We know that everyone will get the chance to hear the gospel. Everyone will get a chance to repent and to follow. And right now, the times we're living in, God holds back his anger. God holds back his wrath. Psalm 11 says, The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Hates. Hates. Romans 6 says, For the wages of sin is death. Right? The, the, the money that you receive, your wages, your salary for sin, your reward is death. Right? Death in this wine press that oozes blood. Isaiah 59 says, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Right? Sin separates us from God. It, God, doesn't, God isn't even close to us. He can't even hear you, can't hear your prayers. You are not near him because you are separated. But see, this is the thing. There is good news. Right? The Bible isn't doom and gloom. The Bible isn't all fire and brimstone. The Bible is about good news. The good news is we can be spared of this, right? We can be rescued. We can be set free. We can be saved. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can be clean. We can be pure. We can be forgiven. This is why we say as Christians that we are saved, right? We are saved. So we have to be saved from something. What are we saved from? We're saved from judgment. We're saved from fire. We are saved from the winepress of blood, right? We are saved. So what do we have to do? What do we have to do to be saved? Well, we have to confess Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We have to confess him as our Redeemer. Romans 10 says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Belief and admission. Those are the cornerstones of our salvation. Those are the bedrocks of our faith. Those are the things that we, we, we place everything on. Belief in Christ, that he is the Son of God, and the admission that we have lived a sinful life, and we turn away from that. We admit our sin, and we turn away from that, and we turn towards him. That's what saves us. That's what puts us on the side of Christ. That's what puts us with the 144,000. That's what puts us in heaven forever with Jesus. And if that sounds like the life you want, if that sounds like the life that you've always wanted, then right now I would invite you to bow your head and pray this prayer with me. Dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus so that I could be your friend. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being with me all my life, even when I didn't know it. And I realize I need a savior to set me free from sin and from myself and from all the habits and the hurts and the hangups that mess up my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I want to repent and I want to live the way you created me to live. Be the Lord of my life. Save me with your grace. I want to learn to love you and trust you, and I want to become everything that you made me to be. Thank you for creating me. Thank you for choosing me to be your son or daughter and to be a part of your heavenly family. Amen.
If you prayed that prayer today, I would invite you to tell someone, keep yourself accountable to a body of believers. This is what a church is. A church is a family made up of other believers who are just as imperfect and just as broken as you, but they are there for you to lean on, to draw support from, and for you to ask questions of. Plug in to a local church. Use your gifts and talents to serve them as they minister and pour into you. This is God's, uh, this is his will for us and for the world to be the church, to be his hands and feet, and to take this message, this gospel of grace, this gospel of salvation to the ends of the earth so that one day every knee bows and every tongue confesses. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.